In this last talk about development, we're going to cover death. And this is kind of the, the last part of development. So we make a bunch of cells, and we turn them into different types of tissues, and then we trim the fat. And that's what programmed cell death is. This is death by design. So how do we know how big of a body we're going to have to innervate? And really, we don't. We make an excess of neurons, we let them grow, find their targets, and anything that doesn't seem to work well, doesn't find a target, we get rid of. The default is death. Only the cells that find their partners and form functional synapses are going to escape the default of death and remain alive. And this is going to be accomplished through neurotrophic support. The type of death that we're talking about today is going to be apoptosis. There's really two types, and we'll distinguish those in the first part. Then we'll go through the mechanism of apoptosis. And finally, we'll cover neurotrophic support. Uh, this is going to involve the binding of neurotrophins to their receptors, and then the removal of receptors, in some cases at very distant sites, and the retrograde transport back to the cell body. Neurons want to find that, that baby bear range of activity. They don't want to be too active, because they'll die, and they don't want to be too inactive because they'll die. They need to have a nice level of activity where they have some functional uh, synapses, but they're not excited to the point of death. Now, death can come in two flavors, controlled and uncontrolled. In uncontrolled cell death, cell membranes rupture. And this is what happens anytime you get, you get a boo-boo. Anytime you get a cut there, that mechanical force shears open uh, cell membranes and you have necrotic cell death. Necrotic cell death hurts and the reason that it hurts is because it mounts an immune response. So the top set of cells there, that top cell is undergoing necrosis. It's kind of swelling up and then its membrane is bursting. The release of intracellular components into the extracellular fluid gets sensed as tissue damage and it mounts an immune response. This inflammatory response stimulates pain sensing C fibers and it hurts us. We don't see an inflammatory response with programmed cell death because it's a controlled way for cells to kill themselves. They do it in a very orderly fashion and rather than spilling out their intracellular contents, they break off little tiny bits of themselves that are easily digestible by nearby macrophages. We don't need an inflammatory response. We don't stimulate uh, pain-sensitive nerve fibers. No pain. So it's a painless way to remove excess cells. There are a few types of programmed cell death. Apoptosis is uh, the type 1 programmed cell death. This involves the orderly destruction of the cell by caspases. The cell is going to kind of shrink down as it's cutting itself up and compacting its components. We're going to cut up the chromatin, so we'll see very condensed nuclei. That's the pycnosis. And the DNA is going to be fragmented, so if you run it on a gel, you'll see the good old DNA laddering as we cut between histones. Type 2 programmed cell death doesn't always result in death. So with autophagy, the cell eats itself. And this is done during times of starvation. This is a way for the cell um, to, to try to harness the last little bit of energy and building blocks whenever it doesn't have enough of that in the environment. If this goes on long enough, autophagy does lead to cell death. But the cell can rescue itself from autophagy. Once we initiate apoptosis, it's over. And then there's kind of a combination between necrosis and apoptosis called necroptosis. Rather than seeing a shrinkage of the cell, we're going to see a swelling of the cell, particular in, particularly in the endomembrane system, so the rough ER and Golgi. We're going to talk more about apoptosis today. That's the most common form of programmed cell death. And programmed cell death is going to be used to clear away excess. 
So we do this in the nervous system, we do it outside the nervous system. You've probably seen the, the fin being cleared away to form a hand. So the way we carve out the fingers is with programmed cell death. We're going to do the same thing with the nervous system. We're going to clear away excess cells. So uh, when the nervous system is first made, there's an excess of neurons to ensure that we can innervate the entire body, muscles, skin, so we have proper motor and sensory function. This is what we call systems matching. So we make sure that we have enough neurons to innervate all the rest of our uh, musculoskeletal and cutaneous systems. After innervation of all the targets, any of the neurons that don't form uh, productive uh, synapses get removed. So here we're looking at systems matching take place in a normal mouse on the left and then in a mouse uh, that's lacking myogenin. So it has a decrease in the number of muscles. Thus it has fewer targets for neurons. So if you'll look throughout development, particularly you go from E12.5 to E14.5, what we can see is a little bit of a reduction in the the number of cells there, but we see a marked difference between left and right. Notice whenever we have a decrease in uh, the number of muscles, we have a decrease in the number of neurons. And that's what all the little blue dots are showing us there. This loss is going to be more pronounced in the ventral horns. That's what we're seeing here. So now we're looking at control and that myogenin uh, conditional knockout. They're doing a zoom in in parts B and D of the ventral horn. This is where motor neurons live. And what you'll notice, far fewer motor neurons in D compared to B. So when we're lacking muscles, we don't need as many motor neurons. And this is just a table showing you the quantification of these data. Program cell death accomplishes that systems matching, and it also does more than that. It can create those sexual differences between the brains. So we have sexually dimorphic nuclei. There are going to be different sizes in the different sexes. Program cell death, of course, is what creates this difference in cell numbers. So if you have more or less death in a region, you'll see a fewer or greater number of neurons in that region. So the sexually dimorphic nuclei that are going to be uh, larger in the preoptic hypothalamus in males, the reason for that is just reduced programmed cell death compared to females. We can also see the loss of uh, guidance cues throughout development because of programmed cell death. We can see the loss of um, uh, attractive or repulsive cues to allow different guidance of axons like this cartoon is showing you to allow different populations of neurons to target different postsynaptic populations. Of course programmed cell death is going to be useful anytime we have damaged or mutated cells so if the cell stalls in the cell cycle because of the accumulation of mutations the best approach is to kill it off so it doesn't continue to mutate and potentially form cancers. And of course just regulating the size of progenitor cells. So programmed cell death is going to do a number of things for us. So for neurons, there's a couple of ways for them to die because of hyperactivity. So there's that baby bear range. If they're too active, they're going to die either by necrosis or apoptosis. That necrosis occurs with swelling. So if the neuron is hyperactive, that is it's firing a lot of action potentials, it has a lot of postsynaptic potentials, all of these are of course allowing for the movement of ions. Mainly what we're getting, sodium influx, of course water is going to follow. So that osmosis is going to cause swelling of the neuron until finally it pops open. Now there's no pop in apoptosis. Instead the cell is going to cut itself up. So that hyperactivity, if we, don't, if we don't balloon up and burst, 
Well, we're going to have to clean up those ions. And that means we're going to need our sodium potassium pump, of course. That ain't free. That's going to cost ATP. The synthesis of ATP by our mitochondria always runs the risk of creating free radicals, the reactive oxygen species. So as those electrons move through the electron transport chain, if they're not properly handled, they can escape and make superoxides. Those superoxides can then damage macromolecules like proteins, lipids, DNA. So we can start to accumulate damage and mutations in the cell, and of course the best way to handle that is with death. So that's what happens on the excess of hyperactivity. If we have hypoactivity of neurons, they're not forming functional synapses, they're not going to get neurotrophic support. We'll get to that in just a bit. Before that, I want to make sure we understand apoptosis. Apoptosis is going to be initiated by damage to the mitochondria. And that damage could come from the accumulation of reactive oxygen species, or if we're just hyperactive and we start to accumulate intracellular calcium, well, we're going to have to clean that up. And the mitochondria are a big source for storing calcium. So we're going to create that mitochondrial transition pore to suck up the, mito uh, to suck up the calcium into our mitochondria. When we start making holes in our mitochondria, we run the risk of activating caspases. Caspases are the effectors of apoptosis. So, when we have permeabilization of the mitochondria, pro-apoptotic factors are going to leak out. These could be cytochrome C. This is a component of the electron transport chain. If you have your electron transport chain components leaking out of the mitochondria, that cell is not going to be successful for very long. So the best approach is to get rid of it. SMAC is another uh, pro apoptotic factor that's going to leak out of the mitochondria. And there's apoptosis inducing factor as well. The permeabilization of mitochondria can occur because of reactive oxygen species or the buildup of calcium within the cell. And once we have permeabilization, of the mitochondria, then we have the leakage of those toxic pro-apoptotic factors. Cytochrome C is a great example. Now the permeability of our mitochondria then needs to be fairly tightly regulated and not surprisingly we have a number of proteins dedicated to this. And these would be the BCL2 proteins. All right. We're going to get two mitochondria up here. We're going to keep it on the same little blob. On one side, we're going to be nice and healthy. On the other side, these reactive oxygen species and that excess of calcium is going to create pores. We're going to create little holes in the mitochondria, and this is what kills us because of the leakage out of pro-apoptotic factors. So, for the BCL2 proteins, there's three broad types. There's the pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins. One example would be BAX. This is going to actually stick into the mitochondrial membrane and form little pores. So it'll oligomerize, it'll self-associate, and create holes that will allow the leakage of pro-apoptotic factors, like cytochrome C. So pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins are going to promote the formation of these pores. We also have anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins, like BCL2. What the anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins do is bind to the pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins say facts there, and then remove them from the mitochondria. So we're going to prevent them from meeting up and forming those pores by binding to them and also 
physically removing them from the mitochondria. So we transition them from the mitochondrial membrane into the cytoplasm, and if they're there, they can't kill us. The last class would be the BH3 only proteins. So these only have the third uh, BCL2 homology domain. That's what BH means. So they only have the third one. And what BH3 only is going to do is affect both our pro and anti apoptotic proteins. So BH3 only proteins, like BAD, for example, it's a fitting name. This is going to facilitate the insertion of BACs and the oligomerization of BACs. BH3 only proteins are going to inhibit the function of anti apoptotic BCL2 proteins so they don't associate with the pro apoptotic BCL2 proteins and prevent them from killing the cell. And they can also stick into the membrane themselves and form little pores. So BH3 only proteins are going to be strongly apoptotic. These are going to induce apoptosis by letting off the break. So they're going to inhibit anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins, allowing the pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins to do their work. And the BH3 only proteins can also lend a hand, forming pores that allow for the escape of pro-apoptotic factors. These will then lead to the initiation of caspase function. Caspases are going to be the enzymes that cut up stuff. So they're like little molecular pairs of scissors. Once we permeabilize our mitochondria, those proapoptotic factors cause the release of caspases, and then we're going to initiate apoptosis. We're going to start cutting up the cell. So the leakage of cytochrome C, for example, out of the mitochondria is going to cause the formation of the apoptosome. So cytochrome C is going to bind to APAF1 there. Um, this is going to uh, expose the caspase recruitment domain, or the CARD, on APAF1, and it's going to allow it to form a heptamer, so an oligomer with seven subunits. I got a little cartoon of this over there. So only when cytochrome C leaks out of the mitochondria are we then going to form the apoptosome which is a combination of cytochrome C and APAF1. APAF1 has a whole bunch of caspase recruiting domains or binding sites for caspases. So the, once we create this apoptosome with cytochrome C and APAF1, that's going to allow for the binding then of the final component, and that is procaspase 9. Procaspase 9 is the inactive form of the initiator caspase, caspase 9. So a procaspase is the complete full-length caspase that has not only the catalytic subunits but also the inhibitory regulatory domain. So there's the pro-domain that keeps the caspase inactive. When we cut off that pro-domain, we're left with active caspases. So caspases are going to cut themselves to turn themselves on. So what this looks like Whenever we recruit a whole bunch of caspases together, all in one place, that's going to increase the likelihood that they cut each other. So they're mostly inactive, but they're not completely inactive. If you get a good enough concentration of caspases together, they'll start to turn themselves on. So when you get a high concentration of caspases there at the apoptosome, that pro-caspase is going to cut its neighbors. And now we have fully active caspase 9. So once we have our activated caspase, it's going to go cut other stuff up. Caspase 9 is what we call an initiator caspase. That means it's going to get this process started. Caspase 9 is going to cut up other initiator caspases as well as effector caspases. 
the effector caspases are going to cut up other stuff in the cell. So their job is to actually carry out apoptosis. They might go directly cut up cellular components that leads to uh, damage or they might cut up cellular components that allows another enzyme to then cut up the cell. So the example here would be the degradation of the inhibitor of CAD. CAD is caspase activated deoxyribonuclease. So it's a DNA degrading enzyme that's activated by caspases. The way that it gets turned on by caspases is by the destruction of a regulatory protein that inhibits it. Because the cell doesn't really want to cut up its DNA. That would be bad. So what it does is make sure that the uh, deoxyribonucleases are inhibited. So the cell creates inhibitors of deoxyribonucleases. When effector caspases like caspase 3 get activated, they go and cut up that negative regulator. That then turns on the caspase activated deoxyribonuclease, which goes to the um, nucleus and cuts up DNA, and you get your uh, characteristic DNA laddering. And that's what we can see up there. We see DNA laddering uh, because of the activation of caspase 3 and the destruction of ICAD. Once the cell has cut itself up, it's then going to uh, create those little apoptotic bodies that are uh, degraded by local macrophages. So in the brain, this would be the microglia. And the macrophages are going to be um, recruited by the release of little chemotactic factors. So when the cell is undergoing uh, cell death, it'll release a little bit of, uh, 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 in this case, uh, lysophosphatidylcholine or LPC there uh, to help recruit macrophages so they know where there's a site of apoptosis occurring. So they let out a little uh, guidance cue for microglia. Microglia show up, they recognize the apoptotic bodies because their membranes kind of get flipped inside out. So uh, before we get to that, look at these data here. That's just showing you a site of um, LPC injection, so that uh, lysophosphatidylcholine injection. At the site of injection, they see recruitment of microglia. That's what this is showing you. So all those little black dots, they're showing up at sites of LPC injection. Okay, so then how do they know what to actually break down? Well, that's going to be... Um, by the exposure of phosphatidylserine. So microglia have phosphatidylserine residues, I'm sorry, phosphatidylserine receptors. Now phosphatidylserine is a cell membrane component that's normally on the inner leaflet. So we got our lipid bilayer here for the cell. Phosphatidylserine is usually on the inside. But in those apoptotic bodies that are being created, phosphatidylserine gets flipped and put on the outside. So the microglia moving around can detect which one of these do I want to destroy by having phosphatidylserine receptors. It'll only stick to and engulf those apoptotic bodies. So, what we're looking at here is the targeting of uh, little beads, uh, little beads that, that contain uh, phosphatidylserine. And uh, when the microglia, shown in, in the top panel there, those are little microglia, when they encounter these beads that have phosphatidylserine on them, they try to engulf them. If we knock down the phosphatidylserine receptor, on microglia, we don't see as much engulfment, and that's what the bars are showing you there. So when we have uh, phosphatidylserine antisense RNA in the microglia, we have a decrease in targeting of those uh, apoptotic cells there. Now let's see apoptosis in action. This is pretty quick. So 
Um, the red is showing you mitochondria, and then the green is going to show you uh, activated caspases. So you'll notice the change pretty quickly when it occurs. All right, you can see the cell changing a little bit there. And pretty rapidly it goes from cell to little tiny blob with apoptotic bodies falling off. Those apoptotic bodies are going to have their uh, phosphatidylserine tags on the outside so that the nearby macrophages know what to engulf and eat up. This is, of course, an active process, apoptosis that is. Uh, it's going to require uh, a little bit of uh, gene expression. So if we inhibit RNA or protein synthesis, we can decrease the amount of cell death that occurs. So cell death is an active process. What we're looking at is, is on the left column, that's with NGF or nerve growth factor. This is a neurotrophin that help keeps, helps keep uh, cultured neurons alive. On the right, no NGF. Uh, on the bottom, they've applied cyclohexamide, which is going to uh, prevent gene expression. And you'll notice only in the top right are we seeing uh, pronounced cell death. So you can see kind of smaller uh, cell bodies there, and they don't have that kind of healthy halo uh, around them. So the creation of pro-death signals uh, is going to be an active process. That's what this is telling us. Now, the removal of neurons from the default pathway of death is through neurotrophins. Death is the default. Neurotrophic factors are going to keep neurons out of that default pathway. So the only neurons that are going to survive are those that get neurotrophic support. We get neurotrophic support at synapses. So neurons that form synapses are going to be kept alive. Neurons that fail to form synapses because their axons uh, don't develop properly or their dendrites don't develop properly or their synapses don't develop properly, those are going to be removed. They're considered excess, junk, get rid of them. So the neurotrophins um, are going to be a large collection of proteins that are going to keep neurons alive. There's kind of a constant release of neurotrophins to help keep a basal level of protection against death, but the release of neurotrophins increases with uh, neuron activity. So when neurons, or more accurately their postsynaptic partners, are active, that active neuron is going to get neurotrophic support from its postsynaptic partner. Um, neurotrophins can also be released from axons to keep postsynaptic partners alive. So, in the central nervous system, what this will look like, it's kind of a bi-directional neurotrophic support. So here's my presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic down here. We'll get neurotrophins released from, this is neurotrophin, neurotrophic factor, let's do that, from the axon to the dendrites, also from the dendrites back to the axon. So we have bi-directional support here, both neurons are supported. Now if we're down in the periphery, let's say we're innervating a muscle, largely what we're dealing with here is the release of neurotrophic factors from the muscle to the neuron. We've got to keep these neurons alive. So the way that they escape death is with neurotrophic factors. They'll get both retrograde and anterograde neurotrophic support. And in the central nervous system, well, there's an awful lot of neurotrophic support. Now there are many different types, as shown here. Some will come from neurons, some from glia. What this cartoon is showing us is that there's just there's a lot uh, more variety of neurotrophic support for neurons in the central nervous system. And this might be due to the lack of regenerative properties in the central nervous system. So if you have damage in the peripheral nervous system, that can regrow uh, to some degree. Not 
the central nervous system though. Now neurons are of course post-mitotic, we're never going to make any more of them, so the ones that we have we need to keep alive. So after we trim the fat and remove the unproductive neurons, we want to keep all the rest of them alive. So we've got quite a bit of neurotrophic support in the central nervous system. <clears throat> now, of course, in the peripheral nervous system, those muscles are going to release neurotrophic factors, and that's going to keep our motor neurons alive as long as they innervate a muscle. As long as they're a functional motor neuron then they're kept alive. So this allows us to have that systems matching that we saw earlier in this talk. So when you remove muscle fibers in those uh, myogenic knockout mice, you're going to of course remove motor neurons because you just simply don't have the neurotrophic support needed to keep them alive. Now neurons are a little generous here. They're of course going to have neurotrophic release to help keep glia alive. So there will be a little bit of a back and forth here with the, the Schwann cells, if we're in the periphery. They'll help keep each other alive. And the same thing is true in the central nervous system as well. So we'll have neurotrophic support back and forth with the other glia there, whether it be astrocytes, oligodendrocytes. There's a back and forth to help keep our nervous tissue alive. And it's all with neurotrophic factors. And this is our uh, systems matching data, shown again, in case I forgot. So the, the journey toward understanding neurotrophic factors, uh, it happened over several decades. So uh, Victor Homburg was the first guy to show systems matching. And what he did was clip off uh, a wing bud and then look at the development of sensory neurons in the dorsal root ganglia. So when he got rid of the wing bud, got rid of the wing, well there's a lot less surface area of the skin to innervate so we don't need as many sensory neurons. There's not as many muscles, we don't need as many motor neurons, we don't need as many sensory neurons to innervate those muscles. So what he saw was this, this unevenness in terms of his cell counts comparing the left clipped and the right unclipped uh, wing buds. So when you clip off one, the dorsal root ganglion contains fewer neurons. And this suggested that there must be uh, something in the periphery offering support. About two decades later, NGF was isolated from snake venom. So uh, what they noticed is that they could grow neurons in culture if they put some snake venom on there. And if they applied uh, antibodies against nerve growth factor, well, these were neurotoxic. So if they used their snake venom to create antibodies, and they applied those antibodies onto uh, neuron cultures, they could block the trophic effects of NGF. And then of course if you actually uh, isolate NGF and apply that to nerve cell cultures, boy they do a whole lot better. So here we're looking at without on the left and with NGF, just culturing uh, chick sensory neurons. They do a whole lot better with NGF or snake venom. You can see a lot of cell death on the left and reasonably healthy neurons on the right. If you inject uh, a, a ganglion, uh, if you inject a dorsal root ganglion with NGF antibodies, those neurons die. because They're not getting neurotrophic support. We eventually figured out the sequence of NGF and the rest is history. I guess all that stuff was history too. But so is the sequence of NGF. Now there are other neurotrophins besides nerve growth factor. There's brain-derived neurotrophic factor, neurotrophin 3, neurotrophin 4, and these are going to bind to different neurotrophic receptors. We have different track receptors, track A, track B, and track C, and we have the P75 neurotrophic receptor. But of course this isn't the only set of neurotrophins. You got glial-derived neurotrophic factors, uh, there are neurotrophic factors from epithelial tissue. There's a lot of different growth factors, and they're all listed there. I'm not going to rattle them off. Now, the different track receptors are, are generally going to be considered pro-survival. NGF binds to track A. Track B is going to bind all the rest of them. And then track C is going to bind neurotrophin 3.
Now all of these neurotrophins are going to bind to a P75 neurotrophin receptor, albeit with reduced affinity. Track receptors we think of as being pro-survival. P75 neurotrophin receptor we think of as being toxic. It's not always the case, but it's a reasonable uh, simplification. So, when we have neurotrophin binding to our TRAC receptors, these are tyrosine receptor kinases, that's what TRAC is. They come together. When they dimerize, they phosphorylate each other and they create binding sites for their intracellular targets. So the neurotrophin recreates the dimer and then the dimer phosphorylates itself. That's of course going to lead to your MAP kinase and PI3 kinase dependent signaling. These are going to generally uh, lead to survival of the cell, the creation of proteins, and the production of pro-survival genes like those anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins. So what uh, phospholipase C is going to do is stimulate PI3 kinase enhancer, or PIKE, which then leads to pro-survival uh, PI3 kinase signaling. Um, what these data are showing us is what happens if you get rid of PIKE. So what they, what they did was use uh, PIKE antisense to knock down PIKE proteins. So we reduce PIKE levels and then they apply NGF. So they either have it or they don't. That's the fill bar or the gray bar. So if you look in part D and F, that's just showing you either PC12 cells or sympathetic neurons. And uh, there's either sense or antisense RNA that's used. When they use antisense, that knocks down uh, pike. When they use sense, it doesn't. So um, whenever they apply NGF, that'd be the that'd be the gray bars. Sorry, it's a little small for me. Um, you see reduction in the degree of apoptosis whenever they apply the sense RNA. Without NGF, we see death. We see somewhere in the ballpark of 60% apoptosis uh, because we don't have NGF around to keep the cells alive. When they use antisense um, RNA against pike, you can see that the anti-apoptotic effects of NGF are reduced. So, clearly pike plays a role in the anti-apoptotic pro-survival activity of neurotrophins. The way that neurotrophins are going to prevent programmed cell death is by inhibiting those pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins. So, MAP kinase and PI3 kinase signaling, uh, these are going to lead to the expression of anti-apoptotic proteins such as BCL2 or the X-linked inhibitor of apoptosis. Uh, BCL2 is going to prevent mitochondrial permeabilization, just like we talked about already. The X-linked inhibitor of apoptosis is going to keep caspases inactive to make sure they don't get stimulated. So we're going to be acting at the level of mitochondria and caspases. We're also going to turn off um, uh, repressors of anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins. So we're going to make sure we have a very high level of expression for anti-apoptotic proteins whenever we stimulate neurotrophin receptors, in particular the tracts. Now, P75 receptors, on the other hand, these are going to bind any old neurotrophin, but they're going to bind it uh, at, at fairly low affinity. So we need to see high levels of neurotrophins, or we need to see improper handling of neurotrophins. So the pro-neurotrophins are actually going to bind with a fairly high affinity to P75. So if we have a lot of pro-neurotrophic factors around, or just a very high level of neurotrophic factors, that can start to lead to P75 stimulation and the activation of pro apoptotic signaling. So P75, it's not a receptor tyrosine kinase. Instead, it probably functions more like notch, where uh, binding of neurotrophins leads to the cleavage of an intracellular domain that then liberates uh, some signaling partners, uh, like uh, the adapter protein in RAGE and then um, the attached gen kinase. So whenever we cleave off the intracellular domain, now these are free to float about and affect other parts of the cell.
gene kinase is going to promote the expression of pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins like BACs. <clears throat> it's also going to phosphorylate and inactivate the anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins. So what we're going to be doing is shifting us toward death whenever we have more activation of P75 neurotrophin receptor compared to TRAC. Now you might be wondering how in the heck is a neurotrophic factor that's released from the muscle going to have any effect on the life or death of this motor neuron if the nucleus is back in the spinal cord? Because that's where these neurotrophic factors are, are going to act. They're going to act at the level of gene expression. How are you going to increase the expression of anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins by acting out there in the periphery? Well, of course, it's through retrograde transport. Once we bind to our receptor here, what that's going to do is cause the activated receptor, once the neurotrophic factor binds, it's going to cause that to be endocytosed. So what we'll do is trap our neurotrophic factor inside and we'll slap that onto dynein. Dynein is the minus N directed microtubule motor protein. So our, in this case, we'll say it's track A, gets endocytosed, attached to dynein, and then trafficked back up to the nucleus, where it can affect gene expression. So we have to engulf those activated neurotrophin receptors. After doing that, we have to somehow attach it to dynein. Of course, there's going to be a large number of adapter proteins, like this shows you. We're going to attach the receptor to dynein, and it's going to run toward the minus end, and that's going to take it back to the cell body, where it can alter gene expression. So, um, the TRAC receptors are going to activate PI3 kinase, just like we talked about before. PI3 kinase is going to modify lipids uh, in the nearby area. So it's going to, PI3 kinase is a kinase that phosphorylates uh, phosphatidyl inositol. So it's going to phosphorylate lipids. It's going to make phosphatidyl inositol triphosphate, PIP3. That's going to create a binding site for a bunch of adapter proteins involved in clathrin mediated endocytosis. So, when we stimulate the receptor, that stimulates PI3 kinase, and PI3 kinase modifies the lipids and tags it as a site to be endocytosed. That recruits the adapter proteins, the clathrin, into the site. We engulf and then pinch off via dynamin, just like we did when we recycled our uh, neurotransmitter vesicles. And then we run on back to the nucleus. When we're at the nucleus, we affect Krebs-dependent gene expression. We increase the expression of BCL2 and the X-linked inhibitor of apoptosis protein, and we make sure that that neuron stays alive. Uh, what we're looking at here is the effect of NGF on the expression of the X-linked inhibitor of apoptosis protein. So control, we're not seeing a lot of expression of XIAP there. The bottom is just showing you actin, so that's your loading control. On the right, we see the effect of NGF, not surprisingly. There's a dramatic increase in XIAP, so we're trying to keep the cell from killing itself. And in the middle, we see the effect of NGF with wartmenin. Wartmenin is an inhibitor of PI3 kinase. So when we inhibit PI3 kinase, no more tagging of the lipids, no more endocytosis of these neurotrophic uh, factor receptors, no more neuroprotection. Now, of course, it's not true that tracts are always trophic and P75 is always toxic. Nothing's that simple in life. Um, P75 neurotrophin receptor can do other things besides kill the cell. Uh, it, can be, it can regulate uh, cytoskeletal dynamics and allow for neurite outgrowth. And in tracts, 
seem to be, in some cases, toxic. So if they're not stimulated, we see toxicity. So by having these tracts, they, they essentially create a dependence of the cell on neurotrophins. <clears throat> and that's what these data here are showing us. Okay, so uh, if we look at part A, we're just looking at uh, cultured neurons. So on the top, they're not giving them any neurotrophins. Um, on the bottom, they're giving them different neurotrophins. Um, so, in, in, in the, the first column, here they're just, this is just their control, so they're not really affecting uh, any sort of gene expression uh, for these cultured cells here. When they knock in uh, track A, so they force the cells to express track A, notice in the top, now the cells look terrible. You've added a neurotrophin receptor, and now all of a sudden, neurons are starting to die. These cells are, are not making it. In the third column, when they put in track B, no real change. And in the fourth column, when they put in track C, again, death. Unless we add the neurotrophin. So compare the top row to the bottom row. Bottom row, everything's fine because they're adding the neurotrophin. In the top, when they don't add the neurotrophin, but they increase expression of the receptor, that causes cell death. So, tracks are good unless you don't stimulate them. Then they lead to cell death. Now, the, the cell death um, doesn't seem to require the, the tyrosine kinase activity. Uh, because even whenever you, whenever you put in a track receptor that has a mutation that prevents kinase activity, that's what we're looking at in panel B, you still get death. So if we look at the top left, when again, when they force expression of track A, now the neurons are dependent on it, so they die. Unless you add NGF, so look in the bottom left of B. They look fine. Top right, we have a kinase inactive form of track A, so no more kinase activity, but they have track A. Yet the cells are still dying. And in the bottom, they're still dying. Because what NGF does is stimulate the kinase activity of track A. But there is no kinase activity, so it's like they're not adding NGF, so they, they still die. It's fairly, uh, fairly complicated. But there's more to track in P75 than just being trophic and toxic. It's okay to simplify them that way, though. That's a decent place to start. All right, that's all I got for this one. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in class.